Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome back to the session on interactomics. In the last lecture, uh, we discussed about different traditional methods to study protein protein interactions like yeast to hybrid amino precipitation. We moved on to talk in more detail about uh, latest high throughput technologies like protein microarrays, how it can be used. Today, we are going to talk uh, in the same continuation about interactomics. Uh, then, I am going to give you an overview of some new tools which can be used like label free biosensors especially surface plasma resonance PR based biosensors, how they can be used to study uh, biomolecular interactions. Uh, and then finally, we will briefly talk about system biology approach, the new emerging field in uh, looking at the high throughput data. Interactomics is a field which uh, is aimed to study the interactions and their consequences between different proteins and other cellular components. Uh, the network of all such interactions which is interactome aims to provide better understanding of the genome and the proteome functions. So, as shown in the slide, uh, the proteome is very dynamic and if you look at the connection with other biomolecule uh, is very intricate. For example, it is connected with the genome, metabolome, transcriptome and the various environmental factors. The flux of all of them are actually governing the dynamic proteome and to study proteome you have to look into the protein uh, interaction networks as well as the protein modifications which are happening like different type of PTMs for the phosphorylation etcetera. So, all of these are you know the complex processes involved in governing any physiological systems. So, interactomics aims to identify the function of uncharacterized proteins, uh, trying to define the new roles for the characterized proteins, what are the mechanisms to regulate the protein activity and what are the possible networks of these protein interactions. So, some of these are the major goals. And to do that, you know, uh, people look for different type of interactions, which are uh, sometimes the interactions could be very transient just for, you know, fraction of second or could be permanent, which could be very strong interactions. So, interaction could also be divided into the weak interactions or the strong interactions. It could be obligate or it could be even non-obligate. It could be homo oligomer or multiple units can come together as a hetero oligomers. So, different ways of, you know, interactions uh, may happen. Uh, and what could be the physical reasons for such interactions to happen? So, for example, you know electrostatic interactions, steric, hydrophobic, hydrogen bonds, all of these are actually involved in these kind of interactions and again studying and knowing that you know different methods of interactions, what are the physical reasons for them and then how to use technologies to study interactions becomes very crucial. So, protein interactions as we have been discussing that it is quite you know crucial for any event which is happening in the cell, whether you, you term as a signal transduction, look at the DNA uh, transcription, translation, even replication process, cell cycle control, various type of metabolic hubs, uh, as well as you know the morphology and the splicing, the growth of uh, uh, individuals, motility, many of these things are you know uh, involved. Many of these biological events actually depends on the these biomolecular interaction events, especially protein protein interactions to happen. So, uh, we, we have discussed that you know there are uh, two broad categories uh, to study the protein interactions and some of the latest technologies which includes protein microarrays and label free biosensors are what we are discussing in more detail to really illustrate uh, uh, all of you that in which way now technologies are really able to help us the biologist. Uh, to find out the uh, information much more dynamic in much more uh, you know high throughput and probably much more precise manner as well. So, today I am going to talk to you about label free biosensors, the label free techniques, how they can be used to study biomolecular interactions. So, here I am providing you an overview of label free techniques and uh, the image shows uh, at least you know the six of the popular platforms. Uh, which could be you know uh, uh, not only label free, but also could be linked to the even microarray based platforms. Uh, among them the shown is uh, carbon nanotubes as multicolor uh, Raman labels. Uh, the B panel shows to you is the planar wave guide arrays. The C panel is about 
nano wired sensor arrays, a D panel about surface plasma resonance, E panel on the nano hole arrays, and F panel on spectral reflectance imaging biosensors. So, all of these uh, different uh, uh, circles shown to you is essentially based on some uh, physical principles involved in looking at the biomolecular interactions. For example, you know when uh, an antibody is immobilized on the nanotube, uh, and if a protein binds to it, what is the change in the conductance which can happen or what is the change in the reflectance uh, in a medium, what is the change happens uh, looking into the interference uh, properties. So, some of these properties have been used to look at the molecular interactions in the label free manner. So, here you are not adding the psi 3, psi 5 or fluorescence labels the way we have done in the microarray technology, but rather we are looking at how two biomolecules could interact together and can we measure that is there any change in the physical properties of them happening which could be measured using different type of uh, physical uh, based principles and the technologies which are associated with them. One of the platform which is uh, quite popular in the field is surface plasma resonance or SPR. SPR measures changes in the refractive index of the medium which is directly in the contact with the gold surface uh, and as you are uh, measuring the percentage reflectivity change happening or how much you know the change in the uh, reflectance is there uh, based on those measurements you can uh, monitor that whether a binding event is happening or not which could be measured in the form of sensorgram which measures changes in the SPR signal versus time. So, for example, as you can see in the plot uh, on the x axis we have the time scale, on the y axis we have response units and then we are looking at uh, from the baseline uh, initially when there is no interaction happening the stable baseline is there and as soon as the two molecules start interacting uh, from those molecules you can see now the association rate can be seen in the green curve if you are seeing uh, now the binding can be seen after some time this binding gets you know stabilized you can see stochastic uh, steady state signal uh, which is R u after and before and then as the you know, binding progresses you are continuing your experiment you can you know if you are floating more of the buffer uh, and interaction is not very strong then slowly the molecule will start dissociating out and that is your off rate the molecules are getting dissociated and then finally, you can use some mild acids to regenerate the chip and now that is known as the regeneration process. So, in this manner you can see the sensorogram which involves the stable baseline, the association or the on rate, the dissociation or the off rate and then coming back to the regeneration to uh, make the chip which can be again used back for the uh, these applications. However, you know the currently available SPR platforms can maximally use maybe 4 channels or the four uh, interactions to study simultaneously. Whereas, think about biological problems when we want to study maybe hundreds if not thousands of these kind of phenomenon to happen simultaneously. So, SPR imaging is a new platform which has come forward which has ability to combine the power of both SPR and the microarray uh, based platforms where intention is to, uh, to look into the high spatial resolution which could allow for the high throughput analysis of the biomolecular binding. Here you are measuring the simultaneously the entire area of the chip surface rather than looking at the very specialized localized area what you measure in the SPR and to do that the whole uh, chip surface is radiated by the light then you are imaging onto the detector arrays and then uh, you are linking that with a CCD device uh, to capture the whole image. So, this platform has shown lot of potential to combine with the micro arrays. SPR could also be combined with another powerful proteomics platform which is mass spectrometers. For example, you are looking at you know how two molecules are interacting and uh, from your experiment you can see there is a, you know uh, a binding uh, event is happening, but you do not know you know this molecule uh, which is bound what this protein is right. So, now to identify those proteins one could uh, elude them out and then analyze them using mass spectrometers. So, now you can say that protein X binding is happening because of the interaction with protein Y and now you can identify those using mass spectrometers. So, this is a, a new application which is the SPR MS based application. So, uh, what I want to emphasize you that in which way uh, technologies, integration of technologies, more robust platforms which are coming forward are really helping us to, uh, to build these kind of you know newer uh, approaches which can be so relevant to study this biological phenomenon. So, uh, while we have you know uh, studied uh, at least you know in, in some detail uh, the basics of the label free technologies, we are going to provide you some more detailed understanding of one of the label free biosensor platform 
which is surface plus bond resonance. So, now let us have the laboratory demonstration for the So, now let me show you the sensor chip that we use for immobilizing the ligand. Uh, there are many types of sensor chips depending on what kind of molecule you want to immobilize and study. So, uh, typically for proteins there is a type of chip. If you want to immobilize uh, a lipid molecule like liposomes, there is a different kind of chip. Uh, for today the experiment, the binding experiment we are going to conduct is uh, going to be studying uh, beta 2 microglobulin antibody which is the ligand and uh, beta 2 microglobulin protein as the uh, analyte which will be passed over the ligand. So, we are going to immobilize uh, anti beta 2 microglobulin antibody on this uh, sensor chip. This is a CM5 sensor chip which is a very versatile chip that is used. Uh, let me uh, quickly show you the surface so that you can have an idea of so, this is a plastic casing and inside it is the chip and this is the gold surface on which the uh, ligand will be immobilized. So, this is housed inside and this is the entire thing is then put in the machine. Now, these are uh, various sample racks. So, depending on how many samples you have, what is the volume of your samples, you can uh, use any of these sample racks. So, uh, in these racks, depending on how much volume of react uh, reactants you are using, there are different kinds of vials that can be used. So, you have these kind, you have these kind. So, this takes more volume than this one and they fit into these, uh, into the rack very nicely. And after you close it, this entire thing will go into the machine. Uh, this is the beer core T200 machine. Uh, this is where we uh, conduct our uh, SPR experiments. Uh, let me show you the different parts of the machine. Uh, so, this is where the uh, sensor chip goes, this compartment. So, you control it through the, through the monitor. If you say eject chip, it takes about a minute for it to eject. So, you will see it coming out and then you insert your sensor chip. This is the sample rack compartment. This is where your sample rack goes in with all your different tubes. Now, if you see on the left side, this is where you uh, have a bottle with your uh, running buffer. So, this, this is the buffer that goes through the machine as well as the one that flows over your sensor chip. This is also typically the buffer that is used for your binding reactions. So, you have to make sure that this buffer matches exactly with the buffer that you use for diluting your uh, ligands or uh, diluting your analytes, etc. Then on the uh, right side you can see uh, there are two bottles here. One is just plain water which is used for flushing out and this is the uh, uh, trash bottle where all the uh, waste uh, comes uh, out. Okay. So, this is where, uh, this is the compartment where your chip goes in. You can see any kind of chip that you can uh, enter into this compartment. So, typically when the machine is on standby, we put in the maintenance chip. Okay. So, I am just going to close it and say dock chip right now. The software that we control the machine through is uh, called the Beacore T200 control software. There is another software here which is called the uh, Beacore T200 evaluation software. So, that is where you get the output of your uh, experiment in the form of sensorgrams and once we are finished with the experiment, I will show you how to uh, extract the ext uh, sensorgram and how to interpret them. Okay. So now our chip is docking, uh, now we can go start the experiment. I will show you how to set it up and then how to put the uh, samples in and start the binding experiment. Okay.
so now we are going to remove the maintenance chip and we will be adding our uh, cm5 biosensor chip that i showed you before so we insert it here and we are going to dock it here we will say so this is the step of docking the chip in uh, an spr experiment has three uh, major steps the first is the immobilization step this is where you immobilize your ligand onto the chip surface the second step is the uh, interaction step where you are actually measuring uh, the interaction between your uh, ligand and your analyte and the third step of an spr experiment is regeneration this is where after your analyte has bound you want to make sure to remove every uh, molecule of analyte that is bound to the ligand so that you make the uh, chip surface uh, uh, available for for the next round of uh, experiments so your ligand stays bound but the regeneration removes every uh, analyte molecule that is bound in the previous experiment so now in the first ex uh, first step we are going to do the immobilization step uh, we use uh, something called as amine coupling in which you are uh, using edc and nhs to activate your uh, chip surface uh, it has a your chip surface has a dextrin matrix uh, to which there are carboxymethyl groups so your protein is going to attach uh, to this uh, through amine groups so uh, this in this step you are activating your surface adding your ligand and uh, then washing off the excess and then blocking the parts of the surface uh, that are not uh, uh, bound with your ligand so this is the first uh, part of the experiment which is the immobilization step so when we start our immobilization uh, experiment we will be controlling everything through the control software uh, we open the wizard that is uh, there for uh, immobilization so open new wizard template click on immobilization okay so this uh, window opens up here um, each sensor chip has four uh, channels on it uh, they are called as flow channels and typically you uh, per experiment you use two flow channels one is called a reference flow channel the other is called a experimental one so what happens is in your reference flow channel you don't uh, put any ligand it's either a dummy ligand or you uh, just put buffer through but it goes through all the steps that are involved in immobilization uh, the reason being is uh, the reference flow cell allows you to measure any kind of non specific binding that might be happening so and then in your second flow cell is where you include the ligand so the flow cell 1 goes through every single step that your flow cell 2 will undergo except that it will not have any ligand on it your sample compartment temperature is also 25 degrees in this machine you can control the temperature from 4 degrees to 40 degrees so depending on what conditions are optimal for your uh, uh, binding experiment you can choose the temperature then you click next uh, so this gives you the rack positions so basically uh, it tells you uh, these are the different types of reactants that you will have to put into the machine and this tells you where to put it in the rack so if you see the rack positions this exactly corresponds to the rack here so for example this is uh, this is how you place it so for example this is this position is a1 which is shown here so this one corresponds exactly to this one so as you can see uh, b1 is is uh, the description of what you need to put in b1 is over here so b1 is edc nhs those are the activating reagents B3 is empty because these are being very reactive compounds they will mix inside the machine the uh, machine will uh, take in the uh, reagents from each of these tubes and then mix it here so you need to keep an empty tube ethanolamine is the uh, reagent that is used to block the uh, sites that have not been occupied by your ligand and uh, so 1 2 3 4 uh, B1 B2 B3 and B4 are for your uh, flow cell 1 which is a reference flow cell 
The same thing gets repeated for your flow cell too. The EDC, NHS, empty tube, ethanol amine. Here there is one extra uh, tube which is your ligand, which is a anti beta 2 microglobulin antibody. That is your ligand. So I'm going to place these tubes into each of these uh, corresponding positions. So you have EDC which goes into B1. You have NHS which goes into B2. You have MT which goes into B3. You have ethanol amine which goes into B4. So now we are finished with the B, B row. Now we start with the C. You get EDC. You have NHS. MT. Ethanol amine. And your lichen. Okay. Then you close the rack. And it's this is now ready for inserting into the sample compartment rack. So what you do is. Once the insertion of the sample rack is over, you click on next. So then it gives you a run protocol and you have to follow all this. At this point you can check whether you have uh, inserted the correct sensor chip, whether all the samples and reagents are in the rack. So you get this uh, window where you uh, get your run protocol. Here you make sure that the, uh, at this stage you make sure that the correct sensor chip is docked. Make sure that all the samples and reagents that you want are loaded correctly. Then you place the buffer, make sure, make sure that the correct buffer is in your left hand side tray. Uh, make sure that there is enough buffer for the entire run. Also that the caps are tight and there are no bubbles that will be taken up by the uh, tube. Also, if your waste bottle is full, make sure to empty that. Uh, make sure there's fresh water in uh, this right hand side bottle. And then you will click on start. So that starts your uh, immobilization uh, reaction. Okay, so now we have finished the immobilization step of this, uh, this uh, binding reaction. Uh, let me show you what it looks like. Um, So now at the end of the immobilization step of the SPR reaction, uh, we uh, open the uh, beer core T200 evaluation software and uh, I've opened the file. The output is a sensor gram. So you click on all sensor grams. So as you can see, this is, um, let me show you first the reference cell. So this is the sensor gram from the reference cell. Here, you, as you can see, this is the step where the EDC NHS is acting and this is the ethanol amine step where the uh, unbound sites are being blocked. If you go to the our experimental flow cell where we have added the ligand, as you can see here this is the EDC plus NHS, then the ligand is being bound to your surface and then as you put the ethanol amine your unbound sites are being blocked so you can see the difference between your experimental cell and your reference cell where there was no ligand being bound so that concludes the immobilization step your ligand is now bound to your sensor chip surface now we will go to the next step which is the binding uh, reaction in this step we will be passing the analyte over the ligand over the chip surface which has the ligand on it now we will start with the binding experiment. Uh, once again we work with the uh, control software. We are going to open a new wizard template, binding analysis. OK. 
Okay. So if you remember from our immobilization, we have used uh, flow paths uh, one and two. So we will be doing a two minus one. That means whatever is measured in your reference flow cell, that is flow cell one, will be uh, subtracted from your flow cell two to give you a specific binding uh, uh, reaction. Uh, chip type is of course CM5. So you will be flowing your sample, which is your analyte, which is the uh, beta two microglobulin protein. And after each uh, sample flow, you will have a regeneration step. So you click next. Uh, we won't be doing any conditioning or startup cycles here. So the main thing to remember in a binding reaction is that you just want a yes no answer. Is your analyte binding to your uh, ligand or not? So we are giving very simple uh, instructions here. Uh, we give a very standard uh, flow rate. Uh, we don't need to do any extra steps. We just want uh, a yes or no answer to whether binding is happening or not. So we give a contact time of 180 seconds. That is enough for your ligand to bind to your analyte. Your flow rate is 10 microliters per minute. Uh, then your regeneration solution. In this case, it is a low pH solution, uh, glycine HCl. Um, which uh, so the contact time of your regeneration solution on the chip will be uh, 30 seconds flow rate of 10 microliters per minute and a 5 second stabilization period then you click on next so uh, your beta 2 microglobulin protein will be in uh, two different concentrations so you can check it under low concentration and under high concentrations and each of these will be done in duplicates so the low one and low two high one and high two And then since we have already primed during the immobilization step, we will not be doing that. The temperature settings are the same. Then you go to next. So again, you get the rack positions here and it tells you in which uh, position to put each of your uh, reaction mixture. So the first one is your glycine HCl, which is a regeneration solution goes into A1. So I am going to place the glycine in the a1 position then in your b1 is the uh, beta 2 microglobulin protein high so this is high 1 which is in b2 then your b sorry your b1 your b2 will get high 2 so i'll place that in b2 b3 has low 1 and B4 has low 2. Close the sample compartment. Click on eject track. Okay. Click on next. Once again, you get the run protocol. Basically, make sure all your checks are in place. Uh, your samples and reagents are loaded correctly. Uh, make sure your buffer is placed correctly in the left hand side tray. Uh, it gives you an estimated run time. So, the, this entire binding reaction will take about 26 minutes. And then you hit on start, which will start the binding reaction. Once again, once your uh, binding reaction is over, you open the beer core evaluation software and you can open your sensogram through this software. So let's open the file, click on all sensograms and here you can see um, the lower two lines are the, uh, the low concentration of your uh, analyte and these two are the high concentration of your analyte. So as you can see, the initially uh, this initial part is where the buffer is being uh, flown over your sensor chip. As you start, uh, as the uh, analyte starts flowing over your uh, chip, you see an increased binding. At some point, you stop the uh, you stop the analyte and you start the buffer, and it starts going down. And then you have your uh, regeneration solution which uh, gets it back to uh, baseline and then again your 
uh, buffer is flowing through. So as you can see the low concentrations are giving a low binding whereas the high concentrations are giving a high binding and the duplicates are showing uh, repeatability. So uh, basically the binding experiment has worked. Uh, let me also show you a kinetics experiment which uh, we have not performed but I will show you a typical sensogram that you get from a kinetics experiment. So what we saw just now was uh, a, a very basic yes no kind of experiment where you are uh, asking the question is my analyte binding to the ligand or not. Uh, in a kinetics experiment you get much more information so it is a uh, uh, it's an experiment where you can uh, find out uh, the association constants, the dissociation constants, the affinity constants. Um, basically, you have a, a concentration range of analytes that you will pass over your uh, ligands and uh, uh, the, you can calculate the various uh, constants uh, based on the uh, sensogram curves that you get. So let me just show you. Uh, so click on all sensograms. Um, surface bound because we are uh, measuring kinetics on the surface of the chip. Okay. So here what we have done is we have used a range of analytes. We have used 0, uh, 2 nanomolar, 4 nanomolar, 8 nanomolar, 16 nanomolar and 32 nanomolar of analytes that are passing over our uh, sensor surface. So if you see these uh, curves, this is the 0 concentration, 2 nanomolar, 4 nanomolar, 8 nanomolar which was uh, carried out in duplicates, 16 nanomolar and 32 nanomolar. So as you can see, you know, here you have the buffer at this position, at this point, at 0 you have started your uh, passing your analyte over the ligand. So you can see an increase in the association of your analyte with the ligand. At this point, you stopped passing ligand and only buffer is passing. So you can measure the dissociation of your analyte from the ligand. Okay, And then you have regeneration. So if I click next, um, let me just go back for a minute. So here uh, again you are using 2 minus 1. So uh, uh, in SPR it is very important. Uh, to do something called as double referencing where um, you use uh, reference subtraction as well as blank subtraction. Blank subtraction means you always have a zero concentration which is subtracted from each of your uh, uh, measurements uh, and reference subtraction means you are subtracting the reference flow cell from your experimental flow cell. Both these ensure that the signal that you are measuring in your experiment is very specific to your ligand analyte interaction and not due to some kind of non-specific binding that is being uh, uh, which is brought about by uh, any kind of uh, uh, molecule in your buffer. Okay. So here you have blank subtracted sensogram. So you see that the zero has disappeared. Then you click on kinetics. Okay. Now here you are going to be fitting to a one to one binding model. So you click on fit. It goes through a bunch of iterations until you get the best fit. Okay. And then this is the output. So if you see these tabs here, there are four tabs, a quality control, report, residuals and parameters. So in your quality control, you see that all of these uh, uh, you see all the green tick marks which means that all the QC checks have passed. So kinetic constants are within your instrument specs, the kinetic constants are uniquely determined and there is no significant bulk contribution. If you go to the report, you can see that it has calculated your association constant, your dissociation constant and your affinity constant. Your chi-square value should be less than 1 which it is showing, your u value should be less than 20 which again it is uh, showing. So these are pretty good results here.
your residues should be within these uh, green lines here that means you can accept this data if it lies beyond these two red lines that means uh, you uh, cannot accept this data and you have to go back to uh, optimizing your experiment uh, seeing what went wrong but here there seems to be a very good fit this is what a sensogram from a kinetics experiment looks like and all of these omics technology you know which is kind of high throughput uh, data generation technology which generates you know big data in a very short time and you know very uh, short span of uh, duration uh, aims towards looking at the entire systems but that is somehow not possible if you are looking at only one part of the picture or if you are looking at only the genes or looking at only the rna or the proteins uh, you may not be able to get the entire picture of what is happening in the physiological system so system biology is a field which investigates the behavior and relationship of all the elements of a particular biological system and looks for integration of the data which could be then uh, eventually uh, computationally modeled and then finally you can uh, display those information to to uh, in, uh, to enhance understanding of a, a complex physiological systems uh, so system biology aims to provide the systems level understanding of biological networks uh, the biological information which you obtain could be represented in the form of the networks which are you know, for the interacting elements interacting proteins and other uh, biomolecules and how they are dynamic in response to various perturbations which are happening so these networks could provide the insights which cannot be analyzed from the individual isolated components of the system and therefore uh, you have to pay attention to various components which are equally important for the system biology field uh, looking at the networks looking at the models doing the computational analysis and the dynamic property analysis uh, broadly there are two major approaches which people have used to uh, to look at the systems based data uh, model based or data based analysis uh, in the model based the prior information is implemented in the model itself whereas in the data based uh, approach of system biology the objective is to find out what is the new phenomenon there uh, in model based uh, system biology relies on computational modeling for example some uh, you know different simulation tools whereas data based uh, relies on the omics data sets uh, the model based field uh, is difficult to build uh, detailed kinetic models whereas data based uh, you are having you know various information from the experimental data so you can look into the uh, complex relationship among genomic transcriptomic various type of other you know proteomic or metabolic uh, networks various pathway the networks which could be derived from the same uh, a system biology triangle involves uh, majorly three aspects one is the experimental part where data is being generated uh, second is a computational modeling where you know you are uh, proposing some models third is the integration with the technologies so all these three are the you know uh, uh, important components of system biology which is known as system biology triangle uh, the synergistic application of experiment theory technology and modeling to enhance our understanding of biological processes as the whole system rather than looking them at the isolated level so what is important here that you know you we want to understand the whole system and if you are looking at systems probably you know uh, the system properties are it's not you know just addition of looking at the dna plus uh, rna plus protein and going to give you you know a 1 plus 1 plus 1 3 but rather these individual component information when you analyze in the complex network form you will find that you know probably a, a new system say, properties are emerging which is giving you better clues and better understanding of the system itself so that is what is you know the power of this new field of systems network and system biology uh, in conclusion uh, we have uh, discussed today the dynamic protein molecules which interact with variety of other biomolecules for uh, in the field of interactomics uh, these uh, interactions could be studied using the label based platform which we talked the last class especially the protein microarrays or it can also be studied in the label free manner which is looking at the surface plasma resonance or many other uh, physical principles which could measure the protein interactions in the label free format the systems level understanding is really crucial uh, to provide the understanding of the complex physiological systems 